thank you for your presence that we sense even this morning as we've come into this room. Lord, we're in a season, another season, Lord, another season as we celebrate you in this Christmas season. Thank you, Lord, for all the things that have happened this past week, the good and the bad, and how you funneled us here, Lord, to be together, to celebrate, to rejoice together. We praise you, Lord, for all the things that will take place this morning. May our hearts be encouraged in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So good to see all of you today. Did everybody have a great Thanksgiving? Yes, three of you did. All right, good. Well, we have a lot that's happening in our service this morning. Um, we have uh, the Cornerstone Twirlers will be coming up in just a few moments, but um, that's exciting. I wanted to share just a couple things with you. The, the decorations are up, and uh, we'll explain our, our theme this season in just a few moments, but um, we have a, uh, a big ladies event that's happening this coming Saturday. Our Cup of Hope um, is happening uh, and you can check the bulletin and the website for more information about that. But uh, that's uh, it's going to correlate with the theme that we're doing today. Our children are also uh, uh, going to be doing the same uh, series that we're doing here in the church uh, as well. But I wanted to point out uh, that we have an incredible outreach that's happening that happened last month, and it'll happen this month, uh, this next month as well. It is our Church in the Park ministry to children here in Manteca. So we have decided to do something uh, 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 partnering with them, and that is a child sponsorship called Berry Merry Christmas. And inside your bulletin, you can see some information. But our goal is to get 100 teddy bears to give to children uh, in, in Manteca. This is a, a lower a lower income area, and we wanted to bless the children there. And so we're asking, if you'd like to sponsor a bear, uh, we're asking for $10. And these are special bears. They'll have a, a little T-shirt on them, a really cute T-shirt that says Kid City, Cornerstone Manteca on it. And those should be arriving soon. But we need some sponsorship, so our goal is 100. And I think that we have already um, gotten about 55 sponsorships already. So here's the deal. You'll see these outside uh, on the foyer wall. Um, you can take one of these if you want. These are just there to remind you. So you can pull one of them off and you can give online or you can give today. Just make sure that you earmark that. If you're giving online, make sure that you go to the Give tab on our website. And right uh, on the Give tab, there's a place there, a drop down, where it says the Very Merry Christmas Child Sponsorship. Um, so our next Church in the Park outreach where we're going to be giving those teddy bears out is December 12th. So that's coming up. If you'd like to help us with that outreach, we'd love for you to do that. Um, it happens at uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, so uh, you can check out your bulletin. You can check out the website uh, when to be there at, for the exact times. So right now, we're going to ask the twirlers to, to find their place uh, in line. And this is a special ministry of the church that's directed by uh, Laura Russell. And come on up, kids. Find your place. I'll stand right up here in the front and I'll get out of your way in just a moment but uh, we appreciate Laura and her team uh, putting this ministry together Laura also oversees our church in the park ministry so she's very active and we appreciate her ministry so we thought it'd be incredible to have these kids come and to share their talent with us in this season I love your shirts it says Jesus is the reason for the season and I'm going to be talking about that in my message in just a few moments but let's put our hands together and let's welcome the twirlers.
And life is taken in the name of hatred. So hard to take. And if we think that it's all good, then we're mistaken. Cause my heart is breaking. Tell it decent. Are you left? Are you right? Pointing fingers, taking sides. When are we gonna realize? We all bleed the same. We're How many of you just say, I, I, I know what Advent is, Pastor. I know what that is. Come on, raise your hand if you know what Advent is. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you have no idea what it is. And maybe some of you might remember even as a kid or doing this with your kid where you have a calendar, um, an Advent calendar. And I know, I know we've all seen that before, right? Um, they come in all different kinds of, of um, shapes and sizes. And basically what it is, it's the countdown right? A countdown to Christmas. And how many have ever done this before? You've done a, an, yeah, see, you all know kind of what Advent is. It, 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 we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about what it really is. But it, it's an anticipation of waiting for Christmas. And, and you open up, you, know, you find number one. I don't even know where number one is on here, but you find number one. There it is. And you open it up and there's a surprise inside. This one, it, it's, a, it's a chocolate, um, uh, a chocolate uh, stocking. It looks like a stocking. Um, how many of you, you have a birthday in December? Raise your hand. You got a birthday in December. Come up and get this. I want to give this to you. Then wait right here. I'm going to give this to you. This is a countdown. Let's give her a hand. When's your birthday? <laughs> December 19th? Yeah, that's awesome. So happy birthday. We have, uh, we've done this with our kids a lot, you know, with the with the advent calendars and the countdown. We just recently got one. Um, it's not the Advent uh, calendar, but it's they, everybody's got something. You know, it's the coffee. We've got the coffee ones, so it's the it's the coffee Christmases, and it's kind of cool. We like that. I mean, there's there's a lot uh, to that because we're anticipating the day, the, the final day, which is Christmas. Some believers in Christ use candles to express their hope and devotion to Jesus during this season, uh, and maybe you have seen that in a wreath. Um, it, it's usually set, an Advent uh, set is set with, with candles that are purple and pink. How many have seen that before? Purple and pink candles. And sometimes there's a white one, right, that's in the middle. Um, the Advent wreath first appeared in Germany in the 1800s. And eventually the wreath was created each year by multitudes of Christians um, using evergreen branches. Okay? They would use real evergreen branches and the candles would be lit on, on, on each of the Sundays, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And then on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, uh, they would light the, the middle candle or the tallest candle or the, 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 the candle that was left representing that Jesus is the light of the world. Um, today is the first Sunday leading up to Christmas of those four and we want to participate in that as a church. And so this is really cool that we're doing this together. Um, we're going to be lighting one of those candles right now. So my wife is lighting one of those candles. And so I've got, four, I've got five candles up here. And she'll, so she'll light one of the candles representing today the first Sunday of the Advent season. And each candle represents or symbolizes an attribute of the Christmas season. And there are variations to these words and different traditions that people participate in. But for us here at Cornerstone, we wanted to use the words hope, peace, joy, and love. So each one of these four main white candles represent those words and those themes. And every Sunday that we gather here leading up to Christmas, we're going to take one of those words and we're going to move it over here representing what we're going to be talking about. So today, what is the word? It's hope over here on this side. 
So each Sunday we'll light one of these candles, and on Christmas Eve, again, I want to remind you that we are having a Christmas Eve service at 5 o'clock. We will light the final candle, which is the gold candle here up at the front, of course, representing Jesus. And so today we begin the Advent season. And Advent really is a season of hope. The, the word Advent means, um, and if you're taking notes, it means coming or arrival. And the season is traditionally a time of, of expecting, of waiting, anticipating, just like how we do with the calendars and the chocolate. And I've got another one of those calendars for the next service. It's a really cool one. It's even bigger than that one. So you might want to stay for that. But Advent is a season that links the past the present, and the future. It gives us the opportunity to remember the times in history when the Messiah had not yet come. And I know that many of us have studied the Bible and the Old Testament and all leading up to, of course, Jesus in the New Testament. So it's this time of waiting, waiting for the Messiah. It's also a time to celebrate the birth of Christ and also to anticipate Jesus' return. How many of you know that Jesus is coming again? Amen? At, Advent looks at that, okay? It looks back and it looks forward. It looks back in celebration and looks forward to the hope that we have in Jesus, that Jesus will come again and return for his people. So during Advent season, we are waiting for both. It's an act of assurance and a hopeful waiting. Christmas traditionally in our culture has been so compacted with busyness. And in and, and, and this season that we're in with the COVID season, it's really no different. I don't know if you've gone out shopping yet, but it's still crazy as ever. Everybody's wearing the mask, and it's still crazy. People are shoving. People are pushing, trying to get the best deal. I was out uh, at, at Cost Plus. They don't call it Cost Plus anymore. What do they call it? They call it um, uh, World Market. Yeah, World Market. And I was there, and it was so jam-packed with people. And I was trying to find some Advent calendars, and who did I run into? Douglas and Chris and Scott. They were there shopping, too. So it was, it, it's, so, it's so busy, and that's the way our season is during Christmas. It's all about gift buying. It's, it's, it produces all of this, and we know it. It produces a lot of stress, right? A lot of stress in our lives. Most of us realize that Jesus is the reason for the season. And I love the shirts, Laura, that you got. It reminds us of that. But really, stress always seems to push out that deep reality of Jesus, doesn't it? I don't know why it does, but the stress just over, overloads us and overcomes us uh, of the reality of the true meaning of Christmas. Advent, though, is an opportunity for us to prepare our hearts and to help us focus on the beauty of of the redeeming love of God for a very lost and weary world. Amen? This Advent season is not a time for us to pretend to be happy or to cover up the pain or the hardship, the difficult times that we've experienced this past year. It's a season really for us to recognize and rediscover who Emmanuel is. You know what Emmanuel is, right? Emmanuel means God with us. That's Jesus, that God is with us. So whatever level you are on right now when it comes to the stress of 2020, whatever uncertainty, those feelings you're having, whatever you, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, I invite you into the season of Advent with me. I want you to know that in the middle of the mess, we've been given a gift. We've been given an opportunity even this morning, to rediscover Christmas. So for these next four weeks, we're going to go on this little journey, and we're going to explore, and we're going to re-explore who Jesus is. And in particular, we're going to understand that his attributes really define the Advent season. It's a season of hope, peace, joy, and love. So today we begin rediscovering the hope. Everybody say hope. We're going to rediscover the hope of Christmas, even when we're surrounded with uncertainty. So let me start off by introducing to you a couple, and no, it's not Travis and Nicole again, but I'm going to introduce to you a couple that we find in the Bible who were connected to this Christmas story. Before I begin to tell you and introduce you to that couple, I wanted to share a little bit of background of the times that, that, that they were going through. A and we think you know, in the season that we're in, in this past year, that we've got it really bad. But really, Israel 
had some major things going on. First of all, the nation of Israel was dominated by the Roman government. It was extremely difficult for them to live in such a harsh uh, 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 culture. It was so difficult for them. And for thousands of years, the Jewish people had been invaded and conquered by by enemies like the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and the Greeks and, and the Romans. And generation after generation, understand this, that people grew up, the children grew up, and the grandchildren, they grew up understanding that God someday would make things right. That someday God would clear it all by sending the deliverer, by sending the Messiah. That the Messiah someday would be revealed. This promise that the people had was just not a happy idea that they held on to. It was something that was deep inside of them. It was their deepest hope that sustained them, that encouraged them. This hope was embedded in their minds. It was embedded in their hearts. They taught it to their kids. They taught it to their grandchildren. They clung on to, they held on to the promise of God day after day. Year after year, they held on to this promise in spite of the heartache and the hardship and the harshness of the government. Year after year, they held on to it. Decade after decade, century after century, they held on to this hope, this promise that someday God would come through, that he would be the promise keeper that he said that he was and is. The cry of God's people was always the same. How long, God? How long is it going to be? How long must we wait? How long can hope survive? Especially when the world is so upside down, when the world governments are changing and our culture is shifting and everything is just so crazy. Will hope still be there when things are so dark? so cloudy and things are so different we see from Luke's account in the New Testament that the answer was a resounding yes hope was still alive and we we know that that Jesus was born we we have that privilege of of knowing that today based upon the scriptures that the long-awaited Messiah the Savior of the world finally came he came unexpectedly as a baby we know that the story of Luke does such a fantastic job of, of describing the whole narrative, the whole story with Mary and Joseph and, and the shepherds, how the shepherds came to see baby Jesus. But I want to jump ahead of that story that we know so well and move to another scene that sometimes we overlook in this Christmas story. It's a scene with a, a couple of characters. Their names were Simeon and Anna. Let's read together Luke's account in Luke chapter 2, verse 22 to 38. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph, Joseph and Mary took him to, talking about Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, in verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the, parents, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. 
Verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many will be, uh, many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Verse 36, verse 36, there was a, a, a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Punel, of the tribe of Asher. She was, a very, she was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon and Anna, they were the sparks of hope that God used. God used, and not just sparks, I mean, these were torches of faith, torches of hope to remind his people that he had not forgotten them. Isn't it so good to know that you get glimmers of hope every once in a while that God has not forgotten you? That God is still on the throne, that God is still in control, that someday, yes, Jesus will return again? Isn't it so reassuring in the midst of fear, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of our pain and the struggles, even in 2020, to get those glimmers of hope that we so desperately need in our soul? This is what Simeon and Anna were waiting for their whole entire life. They both had experienced so many things, so many hardships. We know specifically that Anna had been a widow for decades. And as a widow, she was considered the, the, one of the lowest uh, status in their culture. Both of these characters remained faithful and devoted to God. Whatever things shifted in the culture, whatever governments changed, their devotion to God, their faith in God, their hope in God never changed. They were ready to see God act. They were ready. Are you ready? Are you ready to see God do something incredible in these last days? They were ready to see God do great things. You know what's so interesting is that this account in, in Luke, neither one of these characters seem surprised or uncertain about the fact of who this baby was, that Jesus, this baby, was the long-awaited Messiah. They, they, they were not surprised at this. And when you look at the Christmas story, everyone else in the Christmas story had to have some convincing done, right, about who Jesus was. An angel had to appear. An angel had to appear to the shepherds to, to, to convince them, and they were caught off guard. Simeon and Anna didn't need an angel. They were ready. They were tuned in. They were on the edge of their seat. They were waiting. They were listening. They were expecting. They were filled with hope. And that hope made them ready. Does everybody see that? There was something inside of them. It was called hope. Hope made them ready. Even though these two characters were surrounded by tough times, even though they were growing old in age, they held on to that hope. It was like their attitude was this. Of course God is going to come through. This is who God is. Of course he is. Of course the Messiah is here. God is faithful. It was like their attitude was, they're speaking, God is, is capable. He's the one who keeps his promises. God does not let us down. But we see in Simeon and Anna reveal some things about hope, power our lives. Let me share a couple of those things with us. First of all, hope sees beyond. Hope is the fuel of faith. It is the fuel of dreams. It is the fuel inside of us of, 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 of possibilities. It's that whisper that says, maybe, just maybe. It's that spark of in the cold darkness that, that catches the fly, flame. It's the flicker of first light in, in a new morning. No matter how horrible your year was or how horrible you thought your year was, 
No matter how big your fear got, no matter how big that darkness was that crowded in, let me encourage you not to ever let go of hope. Hope is still alive even in our darkest hours. Even when things seem so hopeless, hope is present. Why? Because God is with us. He is Emmanuel. And here's what's so interesting. Paul laid it all out. He, all, he laid it all out for us in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 through 26. He said this on the screen. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, he says, the Spirit helps in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He said, hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? hope for what you already have? Of course not. When Michelle and I were, 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 were first married and, and, and we were expecting a, a baby a, a, a year later, I don't know if you've ever had those expectations as a parent, but we were so excited to have a baby. I was so weird at that time. Like, I was nuts. Like, I, I was like so nervous about it, but anticipating I mean, we would, we would mark the days off on the calendar. We would make a paper chain. We got the book, what to expect while you're expecting, and reading through that. And I mean, all of it, we were just like so expecting that the baby would come. And, and the baby finally came. We, we had a baby girl. We named her Atlanta. It was so awesome. It was incredible. But we, we, we hoped that that baby would come. But after the baby came, there was no hope that the baby would come because the baby was already there. Our hope shifted. Our hope shifted to new things. Our hope w then would, would be, uh, I hope that, that she can get on a schedule. I hope that she eats right. I hope that, that she's going to walk and talk at the right time. And, and you know how it is as parents. Y you can hope for something to happen, but when it happens, it's not hope anymore, right? Why? Because hope becomes hope reality. Isn't that good? Hope becomes reality. Hope in its very nature exists in the uncertainty of before. It exists in the questions. It exists even in your doubts. Some of you are even doubting the existence of God or the coming of Christ. It exists even in that. It exists in that unclear sense of what is to come. But hope is the willingness and desire to believe beyond, even though you can't see it, what our present circumstance and, our, and reality are presenting to us. Verse 26 of those verses that we just read, it says this, that in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. That leads me to this next thing, that God is with us. Number two, God is with us here, now, and always. Don't ever forget that, guys. Don't ever forget that with God, there is no uncertainty. God knows who you are. He knows all about you. He knows all the ins and outs of your life. He knows when you get up. He knows when you go to bed. He knows when you drive. He knows he is not surprised by anything. God knows us. He knows your issues. He knows your temptations. He knows your habits. He knows all about it. Let me tell you this, that God was not surprised by some coronavirus. He wasn't surprised. He wasn't surprised that you and I would be afraid. He wasn't surprised by our confusion. He wasn't surprised by our frustration. He wasn't surprised by our uncertainty. God sees you, and he is with you. Why? Because he is Emmanuel. God with us. The hope that he came, that he came with when he was born into this world is the same kind of hope that he wants to give to us and deliver to us today. This hope he gives to us is one that is supernatural. It is infused into us by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says even in our weakness, 
even in our deepest pain, even when it seems like there is no hope for any good to come out of the situation that you are in. When we feel weak, when we feel like we don't have any more energy, when we feel like we've come to the end of our rope in a situation, when we feel too weak, that's when the Holy Spirit helps us restore hope by reminding us that God has not walked away, that God has not deserted us. Friends, God is a promise keeper. He never fails. He never lies. He never walks away. When you walk through the fire, when you walk through the flame, when you go through the waters, Isaiah says that God will be with you. And the Holy Spirit's the one that reminds you of that supernatural thing as believers we receive that when you go through those difficult times it's the holy spirit supernaturally that comes that sparks that ray of hope that's inside of us as we close today let me ask you a question what is your next step of hope in this advent season what's your next step so often we want to see tomorrow we want to know what the future holds. We want to know what's going to happen. We want to skip to the end of the story. We want to see how it all turns out. We're so desperate to know, aren't we? Unfortunately, we're not giving that, given that luxury. But those that are in Christ, we know, don't we? And we're confident. We're confident of how the story will unfold. So in spite of our pain, in spite of our brokenness, we as believers find hope in the arrival and in the life of Jesus Christ. If those before, before us, can wait for their long-awaited Messiah, so can we wait for that same Messiah to return to us. Amen. So no matter what life throws at you, even in this Advent season leading up to Christmas, that hope in us pushes us, pushes us to serve God. His Spirit empowers us, even in our weakest times. Will you stand with me? Let me pray over you. Friends, what is your next step? Your next step in hope. This morning, what is your next step? Maybe you need to step forward to the one who can give you hope. Maybe it's been a long time since you've talked with Jesus. Maybe it's been a long time since you've had a conversation with God. Let that be the step of faith today, the step of hope that you need in your life. Let me pray for you. Lord, we come to you and thank you for this, this time and this season that we are in. Lord, it's not a mistake how everything has transpired that even leads us to this first Sunday in the Advent season, this anticipation, this waiting for Christmas to come. Let this season remind us that there is coming a day when the clouds will open and Jesus, you will return just like you told us you would. And so may we be ready. May we be prepared just as Anna and Simeon were. May faith and hope arise in us like never before. Help us to be uh, like a kid, anticipating, waiting for that moment to come. While we're waiting, help us to be found faithful in serving you and encouraging others and letting our light shine so brightly before others that they may know and understand that you are a promise keeper. We love you with all of our heart. We ask your blessing on every family, every marriage, every individual that's in this room. Encourage us today by your spirit and give us that hope, Holy Spirit, that we need. Thanks for listening, guys. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.